Welcome to Caffeinated Flicks, where we drink coffee and celebrate diverse directors. I'm Celeste. And I'm Kenzie. Today, we have our first ever guest, my best friend of 10 years, Beth Hintz. Why don't you tell us what have you had to caffeinate with today, Beth? <laughs> I'm not a big coffee drinker, as Kenzie and Celeste know, so I had a refreshing, warm Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Why was it warm? I can't drink anything cold still. Oh, that's right. Because of your teeth, right? Because of my teeth. So I drink a lot of warm soda. It's not great. <laughs> and it's already hot. That sucks. Yeah. Eh, it is what it is. Yeah. Do you think it'll acclimate sooner rather than later? Your teeth? No. I think I'm just getting used to drinking warm stuff. Oh. You know what it is? You're just becoming European. But it is. There it is. That's terrible. <laughs> it could be worse. Oh, no. All right. What about you, Celeste? I was planning on having just a store-bought iced coffee that I have, but then Billy surprised me with Starbucks this morning, so I got my dirty chai. So that's what I had today. How nice. Um, I got bombarded with my apps that today was National Cold Brew Day, so <laughs> I went to... Dutch Brothers, and I got some kind of cookie crunch cold brew, and it was delicious. But in all honesty, I really went for the sticker that they had. But it was delicious as long as I did it half sweet and took off the soft top and had it with almond milk instead of the chocolate milk. And so basically nothing like what it was actually supposed to be like. Right, you changed the whole <laughs> you thing. completely changed the whole drink. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so they use a chocolate milk? They don't use like a mocha or chocolate sauce? Nope, they use a chocolate milk. And the same as goes for their Kokomo. So their Kokomo Breve is actually chocolate milk shots and coconut syrup. Oh, that sounds delicious. It is delicious. Yeah. Oh, so cool. One of the biggest reasons why we've invited Beth on today as a very special day for us is because Celeste and I are both M. Night apologists, for which we are not sorry, but Beth absolutely cannot stand M. Night Shyamalan movies. <laughs> and this episode drops exactly one week before her birthday. And what better Yay! gift to gift her than an opportunity to tear into an M. Night movie? Absolutely. Thank you. Yay! Happy early birthday. So today we are covering The Happening. Yay! Yay! Question mark. <laughs> A little background info on M. Night. Apparently he completed 45 homemade movies by the age of 17. And his middle name, Knight, was made up during college. And also... Another fun fact, he turned down the opportunity to direct a few films from the Harry Potter franchise, such as The Sorcerer's Stone and The Prisoner of Azkaban, but had to turn those down due to scheduling conflicts. Alrighty, so The Happening came out in 2008 and was nominated for multiple Razzie Awards. If you don't know what those are, it's a parody award show that honors basically the worst of the worst in cinema also known as Golden Raspberry Award. Some of the categories that they were nominated for included Worst Director and, of course, Worst Actor for Mark. He was not great. I will be the <laughs> brave person here and say he was not great in this movie. <laughs> Marky Mark tried his best. Did he, though? Did he? For Mark Wahlberg? Yeah, that was his best. <laughs> Maybe he was just being himself. Yeah, that's the only character he knows how to play. Mark Wahlberg being Mark yeah. Wahlberg. Just, his whole face was just confused the entire movie. Yeah. As was mine. It, oh, no. So we had an all-star cast, including, of course, yours truly, Mark Wahlberg. We had Zoe Deschanel, uh, John Leguizamo, which, in my opinion, I'm going to say right now, I feel like he was the best part of this movie, so... <laughs> I will say he was very annoying in this movie. I do love John Leguizamo. I feel like that might just be his voice. No, because I love him in so many other things like Tu Wong Fu, Moulin Rouge, a bajillion <laughs> other things. Those are just the most popular ones that come to mind. But <laughs> I love him in anything else. I just don't care for him as much. I think he's just really annoying in this movie. I think he's just hitting the nail on the head too hard and going through the wood. 
Oh no. He was just the character. <laughs> he made very questionable choices. Yeah. Alrighty. Do you want to go ahead and do the 10 out of 10 rating, Kenzie? Sure. So the 10 out of 10 goes, I have to say that this movie is amazing. It really put me on the edge of my seat thinking maybe one day this could happen because nature acts out in very different mysterious ways. This director is a genius to create a movie based on nature that doing the killing instead of us watching others killing each other. Very interesting. There's too much violence. I might have no idea what that sentence is. <laughs> For once, we could use a good movie that involves nature and make it more suspensive, leaving you with goosebumps and curiosity. Overall, I think it's a very good movie. So I will go out on a limb and say I don't think it's a 10 out of 10 by any stretch of the imagination as somebody who does love M. Night. Oh, I think a no. bot wrote that. <laughs> Beth, do you want to read the 1 out of 10? <laughs> Sure thing. So the one out of 10 is absolute rubbish. Rubbish story, rubbish acting, rubbish directing. Not worth wasting your time watching. I was shocked at how bad this film is. Characters seem wooden and completely unbelievable. And the science behind the story is almost as bad as The Core. I think that's another movie. M. Night Shyamalan is capable of so much more than this drivel. Mark Wahlberg's character is cringeworthy, as is Zoe Deschanel's. This is about as unrealistic as it gets. I hate to slag off a movie as much as I am, but I see nothing of value in this film, apart from a lesson to filmmakers on how not to make a motion picture. That was brutal. I'm getting strong British vibes. <laughs> That's what I was so thinking. Good. I'm like, this person's British, because I don't know a single American that would say says the word rubbish. Well, not only that, that drivel. <laughs> Slag is very popular over there, too. Yes. But I agree 100% with this review. 100%. If Beth could, she'd probably give it a zero. Uh, no, I'd just <laughs> give it a one. Because it did try. A it's little. A, try. a one for effort. Exactly. <laughs> you give it a participation trophy. Yes. Oh, goodness. All righty. So should we go ahead and get into the notes then? Let's do it. Let's do it. Alrighty. So credits over clouds and unsettling music and wisps of wind. Open to Central Park, uh, New York City, 8.33 a.m. Are, is uh, some text on the screen. Uh, everyone is halted and several begin to walk backwards. Claire, who's a woman sitting on a bench, grabs a hair chopstick and jabs it into her neck. Uh, switch to a construction site. A few men chuckling and someone has fallen and just after they call a medic, another guy falls and another and another and another. Uh, the guy looks up and several men are walking off the road. I will say, if nothing else, this movie deserves points for its creativity and the deaths and just how disturbing some of them are. Like, I... This movie's not scary in, in the least, but I had to turn away several times just for how, like, gruesome some of them are. I'm just like... Ooh. Mm -hmm. They did get creative. As, as, as I was reading over these notes, I started thinking, it's raining in <laughs> Halloween. It's raining. That would have been a totally a different way. vibe. <laughs> a totally different vibe. I'm pretty sure <laughs> when the male reviews do that song, sometimes they do it in construction uniforms. <laughs> Truth. All righty. Then we switch over to Mark Wahlberg trying to convince us he knows science. <laughs> He asks why he's, he asks his class why bees vanished. They say pesticides, pollution, global warming, and act of nature will never fully understand. I'm sorry. I just want to comment that the kid that it, he speaks to about his nose and whatnot, he looks like he's at least 30 years old. Like, I get that some of these actors are, like, in their 20s, but holy crap, that guy, that kid looked so old, and he was supposed to pass as a 15 year old so well also I just... no teacher is gonna insult their student like that that's just mean mm. i love that he's like every year your nose and your ears grow like half of a centimeter or something like that so in 10 years your face is gonna look very funny you're perfect right now but what do you think you're gonna look like in 10 years 
<laughs> so you should care about science. <laughs> that kid's going to have a complex. He's going to be like, oh my God, my eyes, my nose, I look crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but then afterwards, Mark Wahlberg's like, no, you're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. And he just gave him like a finger scan. So he's like, yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be a heartthrob. They gather the, they gather the teachers and declare that it's some kind of terrorist attack in Central Park. Stages to keep out for are confusion and... Sh oh, crumb. Beth, do you remember who this actor is? Alan Ruckman? Which actor are we talking about? The guy who's the principal who plays Cam in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yes, I do know who that is. Is his name Alan Ruckman? I don't think so. Ah, I need to know because he was the principal and it made me laugh to see him in that. And it, I was just like, oh, yeah, that's right. He's in this. No, that it's not. Is it's, that another it's movie? It's just Alan Ruck. Another you movie. were very close. Oh. oh, Alan Ruck. You were very close. Have you never seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? No. What? What? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a movie? Is it a Ferris show? Ferris Bueller's Day Off is an amazing movie from the 80s. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. I can't I'm with you. Lie. I don't want many movies from the 80s. I'm sorry, what? guys. <laughs> There's so many good movies from the 80s. You're missing out. I'm sure there are. <laughs> you choose to watch this stuff, but not that? Come on. Yes. Come it's on, guys. Favorite. I'm the one who referenced it. Oh, yeah. I was the one who called out Alan Ruck. So. <laughs> All right. Then you're Prince fine. Exactly. Kitsy's fine. <laughs> Celeste, for you. Celeste, you need to get your act together. <laughs> no. Ferris Bueller's an amazing movie. I even made Richard watch it. Poor Richard. <laughs> Let's see. We switch over to the math teacher, Julian. He says, probability of things happening in Philly is unlikely. Nice to be a math teacher. People like it when you throw numbers at them, he says. And Alma, who plays Elliot's wife, she's acting weird. He tells Julian not to say anything. Then... Julian says, I'm going to tell you something you should never say to your best friend. I walked into a room on your wedding day and she was crying. She wasn't ready to jump in. So something I have to say here is like, as somebody who did get married, you cried the entire day. Like, <laughs> I'm so confused. Maybe it was a type of cry. Like, if you're crying by yourself, that's a sign. That's a bad sign. If you're crying in front of everybody else, then those are probably just tears of joy. That's not true. You can that's cry because there's a lot of emotions. Like, there's so much that goes into it. I guess. Also, why did he wait until they've been married to bring this up? Did he say it on wedding day? Like, <laughs> hey, I start crying. Maybe we shouldn't do this. Mm. <laughs> it's like, you've already put all the money and effort into it. It's much harder to get a divorce than it is to break up an engagement. Alrighty, so we turn to Zoe Deschanel, who plays Alma, watching the news. Then she gets a phone call from someone named Joey, which, fun fact, is... Oh my god, I forgot his name. M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> I saw he was a part of the cast, and I was like, I don't recall seeing his face anywhere. Right? But he played the other man, Joey, so it was just his voice. We never saw his face. I was looking for his face also, because I was like, he likes to make an appearance yeah. in all of his movies. And I didn't yeah, see him. Exactly. And then when you showed the cast, and I saw his name and Joey, and I was like, what? That's dumb. Yep. So on the news, it's saying that this neurotoxin is flipping the switch, turning off the part of the brain that prevents you from harming yourself. Elliot packs and grabs a mood. So... Beth wants to say something. Beth does want to say something. Uh, <laughs> I just... They've been having this event for like an hour. How do they know that the neurotoxin is affecting your brain like that? How do they know? They don't. They're just making stuff up and putting it out on the news. I think it's just that inference because does people are killing you? themselves. I guess. They need a cause. <laughs> but what I'm trying to figure out is like, one, how long does a mood ring last? Like, if I get a mood ring, it might last a week. If at apparently forever. And yeah. two, why is he attached to this mood ring? <laughs> it says later on, it's from their first date. Yeah, I think it's like a momentum, yeah, from like early on in the relationship. But it is weird. That's like the one thing he grabbed that was like a special item. 
right? Who knows? Who knows? So Joey keeps calling Alma, so her phone keeps ringing. They meet Julian and his daughter, Jess, at Grand Central Station, getting ready to go to Philly. Alma asks Elliot to chat, and she says that she's going to sit alone. Text on screen to Rittenhouse Park, Philadelphia, 11.13 a.m. We see people halt and hear slash see the implemented suicides of Philadelphia. Switch to the train where Alma is sitting by herself, and she's on the phone, and she's telling this guy, you have to chill out. And then he tells her it's in Philadelphia. They think it started in Rittenhouse, another park. Boston got hit too. Uh, the train stops in Filbert, Pennsylvania. Train service is being discontinued. The reason why is because they lost contact with everyone. My question here is, so later on we discovered that it's only, the only parts of the country that are being affected are like the northeastern states. How did, like, how did they lose connection with everyone if nowhere else is being affected? Exactly. Did anybody? It's just a that giant too? plot hole. Of also, why is it only affecting the Northeast? Because they've just, got the most greenery, oh, right? What about Colorado? What about California? No, they're yeah, all good. What about Washington, yeah, because that's too far. They couldn't talk to each other. That far? The plants couldn't talk to each other that far because they've got this midwestern <laughs> desert that's happening between Arizona and Nevada. It's the desert's fault. Oh, that's why we're safe, guys. Desert. <laughs> And the mountain ranges, they're too high. There's too much climate happening in between. But like it, it makes it across an ocean later on. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. So, so they all go to a local diner, and a woman shows them a video of a man feeding himself to lions. Now they're not sure it's terrorists. They, found out, they find out they're in the dead center of all the attacks. Someone claims they'll be okay just 90 miles away. Everyone panics and drives off. Which they find a Sorry, can I just oh, say, sorry, how did every single person have a car that was on right? that train? Right? Except for I them. question that too. Yeah. Like, yeah, didn't all those people come from the they train did. too? Like, how did they have vehicles? Exactly. Who knows? They stole them, maybe. <laughs> Anywho... They find a couple willing to take them, but Julian decides to go to Philly to get his wife, and he leaves Jess with Alma and it. This part is where one of the parts where Julian gets really annoying, and he's like, don't take her hand unless you mean it. He just loves his daughter. Well, I get that, I know, but he's yeah. just being very mean to Alma. Like, had Elliot done it, he would have been fine. It's because he said something. Yeah. Elliot shouldn't have said something. <laughs> yeah, it's Elliot's fault. He's just exactly. being a loyal friend. He's Team Elliot. Exactly. <laughs> they go back to the couple's house to gather some things, and the man tells them that he thinks it's the plants releasing chemicals. This man is also really obsessed with hot dogs. True story. He thinks they're underrated, and he keeps bringing them up. Then Julian arrives in Philly, and they drive up to multiple hung bodies. Uh, they try to secure the vehicle so no air gets in, and he attempts to calm everyone with his math problems, but realize there's a slit in the tarp. Now, if I'm ever in a dangerous or deadly situation, the last thing I want to think about is math. I don't want to be doing complicated right? equations <laughs> in my head, especially without a pencil and some paper. Like, damn. True. <laughs> or without a calculator. Right? And also, why did they keep driving? I would have turned around and been like, deuces. Yeah. Bodies? No. Why didn't they reverse? Clearly, everybody's yeah. dead. So, oh, yeah, yeah. This isn't, yeah. these are not the directions you're looking for. Also, why did he leave his daughter? Just saying. Like, silly choices, John Leguizamo. Silly choices. I guess the question is, are you better off if you all died together, or are you better off if the parents die and the kid stays supposedly alive but you don't know she's gonna stay alive that's the thing i'd rather lose one parent than both this is true all righty so they commit suicide on the road they come across dead bodies blocking their way uh, that's when <laughs> wait 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 you you need to say that we're now back mark Wahlberg, alma and the other couple <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. They committed suicide, and now they're on the road. 
<laughs> okay, what? Yeah. <laughs> We're back to the other people who aren't dead yet. <laughs> On the road, they come across dead bodies blocking their way. And that's when the woman goes we got binoculars in the back from when we were spying on our neighbors i'm sorry what this is a red flag <laughs> like why <laughs> right at that point they should have gotten out of the car and been like we'll walk from here like, we're good. We're good. <laughs> they attempt to find an alternate route and connect with other groups only to find casualties in all directions they discover philly's been hit and realize jess's parents are hit. i swear to all that is good though this is when we hear the most noise come out of just the entire movie. Yes. Yes, it is. Because I don't think she talks. She whispers. At all. She whispers. She whispers. Yeah, she whispers in their ear, but we don't hear what she says. She so. does have a short yeah. conversation with Alma, like, twice. But that's kind she, of it. Yeah, she also talks to her dad one time. All right, so they decide to head on foot to a small county called Arendale. Not to be confused with Avondale. Or not to be confused with Frozen. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> they see wind blowing. Oh, no, Alma tells Elliot about Joey. <clears throat> and then they see wind blowing in grass, and one of the groups begins committing suicide. Elliot says, oh, no. I'm sorry, the way <laughs> that line just cracked me up because he was just like, oh, no. Like that's all of his lines. <laughs> it's like that. I feel like that's how he would actually react. He would just be like, "Oh no!" And the group decides to appoint him as their leader, apparently, and they tell him that he needs to do something because there are children over there. <laughs> Elliot has some sort of a panic attack and says it's the plants releasing a chemical and targeting larger groups. What I can't figure out is why did they choose him? To put <laughs> their lives in his hands. Like, he's just... Oh, because he talked to that general earlier. Yeah, exactly. That's mentioned. why. So that's why. Because he exchanged a few words. You spoke to him. So you know what's you up. You know what to do. Yeah. That's why. That's the stupidest reason I've ever heard. And also, apparently nobody else <laughs> wanted to step up. Like, his face looks like that <laughs> meme of somebody trying to do, like, intensely difficult, like mathematic calculations to solve the problems of the universe you know his face probably is a meme it probably, <laughs> probably is. It should be. <laughs> i'd be shocked if it wasn't he tells everyone to stay ahead of the wind and break into smaller groups a gust of wind blows over but they aren't affected they locate a house and elliot tries talking to a plant in a very positive manner but realizes that it this part was actually hilarious because the AC <laughs> kicks on and so the plant is starting to like move a little bit and so he's extremely slowly walking over to it and he's like, we're just here trying to use the bathroom. We're not trying to hurt you. Sending good vibes. Sending good vibes. <laughs> and then he comes straight like nose to one of the leaves. It brushes his nose and he's like, you're plastic. I'm talking to plastic. <laughs> and then he keeps talking to the plastic. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then he keeps talking to himself. <laughs> oh, God. So these two teenage boys decide to tag along with them. And they discover that he's having problems with Alma. And give him marital advice. And it's actually really good advice that this teenage boy gives him. What is it? He has to take responsibility or self-responsibility or something like that. I'm like, that's not... And Elliot decides to tell Alma he saw a very good-looking pharmacist and asked where the cough syrup was, and he didn't even have a cough. And he almost bought it. So that was his payback, I guess. <laughs> Alma asks if he was joking, and he nods yes. She says thank you. So this was actually very funny in my opinion. But part of it, I think, was just like she told him about Joey because – what happened between her and Joey is that they went and they had tiramisu and that was it. And so that was him just saying, nothing happened. It's fine. Laughed it off. Like we're in a much dire situation now. Like, let's move on. Right. It was so weird how she was so upset about the fact that they had tiramisu together. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, it is the sexiest of the desserts. True that. Also, I feel like she said tiramisu really funny over there. 
I think she's a tiramisu. Yes. A tiramisu. They find another house because Jess needs a break, but the people inside accuse them of being terrorists and shoot both of the teenage boys that they're with. Dude. <laughs> so it took me a very long time to realize that Spencer Breslin was in this movie. <laughs> and then when I saw him get shot first and then his friend get shot, I was like, oh, no, <laughs> there goes Breslin child down. <laughs> well, he was being a jerk. But also, those people that were so afraid of the toxin getting in would not open the door and open a window to shoot somebody. They wouldn't do it. They come across another house with a creepy old lady, and she offers them a meal. Which is so funny how she does it. She's like, I suppose the polite thing to do is to offer you a meal. Well, I'm not going to say it again. (laughs) She's a bitchy old lady the whole time. Uh, (laughs) She's being nosy about their relationship, and she smacks Jess really hard when she tries to go for a cookie. I don't know how they didn't say anything. That sounded like it really hurt. Right. She reveals she has no contact with no one, and when they try to tell her what's going on, she tells them she doesn't want to know. The next morning, after Elliot finds a creepy doll in her bed, I believe it was, uh, the old lady, Mrs. Jones, snaps and accuses them of stealing and kicks them out. Okay. On a scale of one to get the fuck out of there, how creepy was this doll? Hella creepy. Hella creepy. What is that, Annabelle? I would have left the that night doll? before when she was like, I hear you whispering. Are you going to murder me? Yes. I'd be like, no, you're going to murder me. I got to go. That gave me, what is that other movie of his? The Visit vibe. Yes. Oh, my God. Like I, I was getting that those vibes from her. Definitely, yeah. She was a terrifying old woman. She seemed like she was about to have a break at any given moment. But to to your point there, Beth, like the way that he responded to her when she says, "Like I hear you whispering, you're gonna murder me in my sleep and take my things," and he's like, "No, we haven't been talking about that at all, right?" It's just, "No, we're not." What are you talking about? Hey. And then she just leaves. She's just, okay. What? <laughs> She's like, I've already put a hex on your room anyway. <laughs> right? Oh my gosh. Oh. When he walks out to talk with Mrs. Jones after, oh, let's see. After she's retreated to her garden, he sees she's been affected. He hears Alma and Jess and discovers that they're in the outhouse. I do have to stop you real quick because the way that she kills herself is. Mm-hmm. I think one of the most disturbing ways in this entire movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Agreed on that. Yeah. So what happens is he sees that she stops in her garden and she starts to walk backwards. And so he sees that the wind's kicking up gusts so fast. And so he quickly closes the doors. He thinks that Alma and Jess are still in the house. So he yells up to them in the house and says, hey, close all the windows and stuff and the doors. And as he's doing that, he's hearing her walk around the porch and all of a sudden he starts hearing banging against one of the walls. And then he sees her in the window and she crashes her face into the window. And so wind is rushing in through the window and she's got like glass in her face and in her eyes. And she goes to the next window and she pummels that one too. And so then he locks himself into like a kitchen cellar or something of that nature. And that's where he hears Alma and Jess because there's like a tube that goes underneath the ground to the outhouse cellar garden place. (laughs) I think she called it a spring house. It's where they used to hide slaves. Let's see. He says the plants must have gotten more sensitive because Mrs. Jones was alone. Alma and Elliot reminisce about their relationship. Uh, Elliot says, if this is the end, he wants to be with her, and he walks out. Alma and Jess also walk out. Uh, Then we see text on screen, Arendelle County, 9.58 a.m. Then we flash forward three months later, and it's the first day that schools have reopened. A doctor on the news says this was a warning or a threat to mankind because we're destroying the planet. Alma discovers that she's pregnant, and then we go all the way over to 
France, it sounds like, a uh, closing scene to a park in France, and it begins again. The end. Yeah. Yep. I was just confused <laughs> by the fact that everyone was just kind of, all right, all of the plants magically decided to try to kill us and then got over it. And then they do nothing to, like, try to stop it from happening again, to stop it from being worse. They just, They're just like, okay. Yep. They just go back to their normal lives. Yeah. That was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Confusing. So it passes the Bechtel test, and you're saying because Jess and Alma had a conversation for, like, a split second, it sounds like? They do. And especially at the end when she's talking, Alma's talking to Jess about the first day of school and she's like hey hold on i've got let's put this in your school bag and then she says i love you auntie Alma." okay it passes by a sliver what's the bechdel <laughs> test i don't even know what that is so the bechdel <laughs> test is a piece of media where two named female characters have to have two lines of dialogue where they talk to each other and it has to be something other than a man okay so, like, if Celeste and I were to be talking, we can't talk about Billy or Richard or some other dude. Like, it'd have to be about something else. I see. Okay. We do that all the time. <laughs> we do. But in movies, they don't. <laughs> That's true. If they even have two female characters, honestly. Like, we did <laughs> Nope, mm -hmm. and they only had one female character. <laughs> So, any other thoughts there, Beth? <laughs> so very many thoughts, but it's just, I just did not, this movie. But you guys warned me it was not going to be good, and I knew it was not going to be good. It's just, there's just so many plot holes, so many questions. None of it makes any amount of sense whatsoever. And then it's just <laughs> over. Was there anything you liked about it? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, just, this is I have a broad question. spectrum, no. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. If we can all agree that the casting, it was an odd choice, I feel like. Yeah. Especially for M. Night, because I feel like he casts like a certain type of actor usually. And Mark Wahlberg and Zoe Deschanel was an oddball, I feel yeah. like. Anyways, but let's say they had casted two other people as the leads. Like, I randomly thought of Eric Bana and um, Rachel McAdams. Would you feel slightly different if it had, you know, different casting? Absolutely not. There's just too no. many plot holes in the movie <laughs> for it to make sense from any type of, like, scientific standpoint. But also, I just felt like the writing was a little bit off. Like, it was kind of, especially, uh -huh. like, Alma's character, almost all of her lines were really cheesy. And I don't know if that's because they played into Zoe Deschanel, because that's kind of who she plays as a character. She's a goofy gal. Exactly. Yeah. And so all of her lines mm -hmm. were, like, I couldn't take her seriously a minute. It was just goofy lines and big wide eyes the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> her character the entire time was just doe eyes. And then Mark Wahlberg was just confused face. That was yeah. the entire yeah. movie. Exactly. I don't think he could have helped it though. Because those are just her eyes. <laughs> but they just, they focused on them a lot. It was like they would do a lot of close ups yeah. of her just wide eyed. Right. Yeah. Well, and as somebody who has doe eyes, there's a lot you can do with makeup. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I will say at the end when they're reminiscing about their relationship and the, the part where the mood ring comes in, it is really funny how they're like, remember how you wore it and it turned purple and you thought that purple meant that you were in love, but it turned out it just meant that you were horny. I was like, that is not appropriate for oh, an yeah. eight year old. <laughs> they didn't care. They were about to die. Right At that point, she's seen so much death. <laughs> One is horny. That's nothing. <laughs> that is fair. Oh, this poor girl needs so much therapy. So <sighs> much therapy. Yeah. Poor babies. Alrighty. So some random trivia about this movie. So apparently M night, wrote the screenplay with Mark Wahlberg in mind for the lead role. Which I feel... That yeah, makes sense, though. The writing makes sense now. If that's who he thought was going to be his lead, he was playing into him. <laughs> makes no sense. There you go. It makes sense as to why it's bad. <laughs> I'll say that. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, supposedly, Mark Wahlberg admitted that he regrets working on this movie 
but he said you can't blame me for wanting to try to play a science teacher at least i wasn't playing a cop or a crook what i don't understand about that statement is he's played both things he's been a cop and he's been a crook <laughs> That's what he meant. He was really typecast for a long time oh, as a okay. cop and a crook. So he was like, at least I'm doing something different. It wasn't a oh. great different, but it was something different. Okay, that makes sense. There, you go. there are things that he does not do well. Then that's exactly. okay. We can all admit to our he strengths tried. and our weaknesses. That's why he went back to playing yeah. cops. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, not everyone is versatile. So <laughs> now he knows. Not everybody's the rock. <laughs> Wait, what are you talking about? The Rock is like the perfect example of a type. Was that sarcasm? That was sarcasm. Okay. It was a joke. <laughs> I couldn't see your face. Wow, so I was watching your face with my nose. I'm like, oh. I wonder who is somebody who can do everything. Huh. I feel like Pierce Brosnan's up there. Except for Singh. Remind me again who that is. He did. He was in Mamma Mia. Double of yeah. seven. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's a good. <laughs> oh, Selma Hayek. She can do everything. Oh yeah, she can. Yeah. Selma Hayek. Oh yeah, she's Selma. Hayek. Mm -hmm. She can do everything. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh gosh. All right. Should we go ahead into this other random fact? Yes. I feel like it kind of gets off topic. Okay. <laughs> So I saw it, and I thought it was just interesting. Uh, the plot of the film takes inspiration from a real phenomenon of the trees of the acacia genus. Acacias have a defense system. Each plant is in close contact with another. If it is approached by a predator of its, fo of its fo foliage, right? Uh, the, plant, the plant, words are hard. The plant reacts chemically releasing substances that are transferred by air and reaches the other plants, raising the alarm. Immediately, the rest of the acacia specimens that are nearby will begin to secrete a toxin substance in their leaves that is harmful in contact and harmful in contact ingestion and even deadly for animals. I just have to say, I was so happy to see that animals were not harmed in this. Yeah, right? Because the plants can pick who they're going to kill. They're like, no dogs. Nope. They're fine. Oh, my God. They're just creating a safe haven. For the animals. Yeah, that's what they're leaving behind. Right. Screw the people. Just animals <laughs> and plants. That's it. I wonder if that means that predators have an abundance of food as well, meaning that traditional prey animals would then have the opportunity to just populate at will. I don't know. Random thought. Sorry. Random thought. I'm sorry. But also, if this is kind of what they base it off of, it makes sense for one plant. But how did all right. of the plants do it? It's not like they had the same plants in all of the parks, in all of the world, and everywhere they went. Just and saying. not only that, it didn't travel by wind. Yeah, exactly. It was just inspiration, guys. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> but, I mean, if there's anything, we don't know. Anything could happen. No. I keep thinking that the thing will happen at some point. <laughs> Now, if anything like this is to ever occur, we can't be like, what's happening? We'll be like, mm, it was bound to happen. <laughs> Sooner or later. Sooner or later, <laughs> the plants are coming for us. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's on the horizon. It has to be at this point. Like, <laughs> we are taking ourselves out at some point, so. <laughs> I think we got to take ourselves out, and then the plants will take over. Probably not the plants <laughs> killing us. Oh, yeah. We'll definitely take ourselves out first. <laughs> At the rate we're going, definite. So Beth gives it a one out of ten. Is that correct? Participation trophy. <laughs> I gave it a participation trophy for trying. <laughs> that's nice of you. I know, right? <laughs> but that's all it gets. <laughs> I will give it a three out of ten, just for some of the funny bits. Predominantly, this is one of those movies that I love to watch because it's bad. So if you go into it with that mindset, then to me it's enjoyable. <laughs> I agree. I'm. I was gonna say a four, but now I kind of want to bring it down to a three. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give it four just to be because <laughs> it deserves it. <laughs> if you add mine and Beth together, that's a four. Exactly, it's a collective score. Yeah, I love the story idea and its uniqueness. Like honestly, I feel like 
we're so used to like super extreme over the top natural disasters occurring as a result of humanity's treatment uh, to our planet. Uh, so I just thought it was an interesting take on the subject. So I'm going to stick with my four rating. <laughs> I might have given it a better rating if it was happening all over. If it was happening to the whole. Yeah, it would make more sense. Yes, at the same time. Mm -hmm. All right. But the fact that it was just that weird northeast corner. No. <laughs> I don't know. I think <laughs> it makes sense if it's kind of like a migration. Like if it's if it's a spreading phenomenon. But it didn't. It just stopped. <laughs> no, no, no. But what I'm saying is, to me, if this was to be remade, you know, into something mm -hmm. better. Um <laughs> And it, it's more of a, a spreading phenomenon. And it's it's almost like an I am legend meets the happening meets. Yeah. I'm trying to think of something else where they're look like meets zombie land, you know, where they're trying to find like a cure, but also trying to beat it, you know, oh, meets um, warm bodies. You know, <laughs> this is all zombies. Um, <laughs> I think yeah. that, that would be better. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, but like France, where is that on the map? I feel like that's... It's a whole ocean away. <laughs> France missed the plants off I too. Know, but okay? like if we're thinking starting from right to left well, she... and we go to another We're saying if it was a different movie. Like... If it was a different movie where it spread, it would be more <laughs> believable. Like yeah. why did it stop at 90 yeah. miles? Oh. True. I wonder if 90 miles means something. No, it's just that... M. Knight's from Philadelphia, and he wanted to make sure that they got to Philadelphia. <laughs> right. And that's all their budget could oh. afford. They couldn't get past that. We can't film the rest of the U.S. You're the rest. Oh, my goodness. I love it. I love it so much. But yes. So this is, I love M. Night movies. This is one of those ones that I just watch when I want to watch it because it's so bad. And it's just funny to watch the acting because it's so bad. I will say some of the shots, they reminded me of like a telenovela. <laughs> and it's like, like the drama. I can see that. Like, if you know, you know. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm like, what am I watching? But yeah. You love to hate it. It's one of those movies. Nobody got slapped, though. Like, <laughs> oh, true. <laughs> However, that look that no, technically just <laughs> oh, that's true. She did get slapped. Hot damn! It is a telenovela. All right, before this devolves any further, <laughs> thanks for having me. So, a special thanks to Beth for joining us for this episode. We do plan on having her join us again for a future episode. And if any of our listeners have any custom gift needs, from cups to wooden signs to more. You can contact her via Instagram at artistichints1. That is A R T I S T I C H I N T Z and the number one. And we will also go ahead and tag her on our Instagram as well. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Caffeinated Flicks. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can follow us on Instagram at Caffeinated Flicks Pod or email us at Caffeinated Flicks at gmail.com. And just like every other podcast, we would love it if you could follow us in your podcasting app and give us a rating or review. Your feedback helps us get better. And if you're enjoying us so far, please tell a friend. We'll catch you on the flip side.